So there's a couple of key questions that we, that we can focus on as Christians that will help us in our approach to, to talking about the whole issue from the fathers to the mothers to the children to the doctors who perform these. And one of those key questions is who is my neighbor? So I'm, uh, I love icons. I think they're a wonderful, nonverbal way of communicating a message. So I want to share a couple icons in this, chap- in this talk and in the next talk. And this is an icon that talks about uh, a story. And this is the, chap- the Bible verse for today. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, what's written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? And in reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, they beat him, and they went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, pass by on the other side. But a Samaritan, one of those awful Samaritans that don't exactly believe the way the Jewish people thought they should believe, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he brought the man on his own donkey and brought him to an inn to take care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Well, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. So why do I bring up that story? We have a fundamental question. Who is our neighbor? It is a philosophical question that has been around at least since the time of Jesus. Our neighbor is the circle of entities who we protect as our own, who we consider deserving of care, and who should be treated with fairness and protected by our society. That's who our neighbor is. We would think human beings, human persons, human souls, those all should be in our circle. They're all our neighbors. They're all bearers of the image of God. Entities that are outside our circle can be treated as property. They're things. Well, what happens when we take human beings outside of our circle? What if we we, we allow for research on human beings? We allow for the destruction of human beings that make life a problem for ourselves. We allow for enslavement of human beings if they're not in our circle of who is our neighbor. Well, what about human persons? This is actually a legal question. Human being is a human. A human person is legally defined as the object of legal rights. There are two kinds of legal persons, human beings and artificial persons, such as corporations. The Supreme Court, unfortunately, has a history of sometimes getting it really wrong. So there was a case of Dred Scott, who was a slave who went into free territory, and he claimed he was free, and the slave owners claimed he was their slave. So the question went to the Supreme Court, whether or not Dred Scott was free. And the Supreme Court said, the question of whether or not Dred Scott qualified as a human being was considered moot. We're not gonna touch it. What they said, the crucial question was whether whether or not he qualified as a person. That is, as in the circle of who we protect, okay? If you ever want to get really violently physically ill, Read the Dred Scott decision. The 14th Amendment to the Constitution says all 
persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction are citizens. No state shall make or enforce any law, any law which will abridge the privilege or immunity of citizens or shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process. So the question of personhood is key, especially when we consider who, uh, who we are legally and how we legally protect each other. But the US Constitution actually fails to give any sort of a definition of human being. And it isn't unless it's only in the uh, 14th Amendment that you have anything that even resembles something that uh, is a citizen, okay? So the judiciary has had to make up their own definitions. The 14th Amendment established the basic constitutional guidelines for citizenship and indirectly the definition of personhood. So this is from Roe versus Wade, a decision that is uh, up for grabs right now with the, um, with the Dobbs uh, case before the Supreme Court. And this is what it says in Roe versus Wade. The appellee, that is the, the people, uh, the, the um, plaintiff wanting to change the abortion law, argued that, I'm sorry, the, the, per, the state of Texas um, who did not want to change the abortion law, they argued that the fetus is a person within the language and meaning of the 14th Amendment because the fetus is a human being. If the personhood of the fetus is established, the uh, the uh, Rose case falls apart, the, the plaintiff's case falls apart, because the fetus's right to life is guaranteed specifically by the 14th Amendment. But the Supreme Court chose not to do that. The 14th Amendment was intended to protect people from discrimination and harm from other people, and racism is not the only thing that people need protected from. The protection of the 14th Amendment is available to protect all human beings. The Supreme Court could define person to include all human beings before birth and after birth. It simply chooses not to do so yet. Science, history, and tradition establish that, that preborn human beings are from the time of conception both persons and human beings because personhood is a legal attribute that we apply to human beings. So the criteria for interpreting the unborn as person is, is fully there, and, and that criteria actually applies more to unborn human beings than it does to corporations or artificial persons. So we, the Supreme Court could overrule verse, Roe versus Wade solely on the grounds of equal protection, and we'll see whether or not they decide to do that. So if law can't really help us, and we'll see in this next six months what, what law does to help us, maybe the Sagittarius can help us. So if you look at philosophy and rhetoric, um, there is a biological classification of human being, but some people say, well, you can lose that. You can lose personhood, you can gain personhood, you can lose personhood, because it depends on the question of what makes you a person, okay? So adult human beings are commonly considered persons, and a very interesting question is to ask yourself why. Clearly not having a particular hair color, or having hair, or being a particular height or weight, or having a brain, those don't make us people. So what makes us a person? So the concept of metaphysical personhood would be to use personhood as a category of reality, encompassing beings of a certain type. That means you have to have certain criteria to meet the criteria of personhood. But there's no consensus about the criteria. So these are criteria that have been proposed, rationality or logical reasoning ability, so some of us are more persons than others. Consciousness, self-consciousness, that is self-awareness, use of language, ability to initiate action, moral agency, the ability to engage in moral judgments, intelligence, these have all been assigned as potential criteria for personhood. But what happens when you're under anesthesia and you lose all of these? Do you become a non-person until you wake up and then you're a person again? Or what happens when you're sleeping? Does having one or more of these make us a person? Do we have to have them all? Is there some minimum set that we can have? Does it have to be the same set for all people? So 
what is personhood? What, who, who do we consider as part of the, the, the circle of human beings? Maybe theology can help us. Well, there's actually two different schools of theology, and creationism isn't what you think. It's a technical term, so bear with me, okay? Traducianism and creationism. So traducianism says it's one of two biblically plausible views on the origin of the human soul. Traducianism is the theory that human beings are made as whole beings. So at the moment that sperm egg membrane fusion happens, a soul exists. Creationism, on the other hand, says that God has uh, this thing, this entity in the womb, and at some point pours a soul into it. The ensoulment theory. Pythagoras, the Greek, is the first one who uh, sort of articulated the view that we're all human beings, body, soul, and spirit at one time, and therefore he was against abortion. Aristotle, on the other hand, said ensoulment happens later. 40 days if a male, but 90 days if a female. Abortion is permissible for the good of the state. Unfortunately, the Christian scholastics followed Aristotle. Aquinas, unfortunately, who was very prominent in the Roman Catholic Church, um, thought that the human brain had sufficiently developed around mid-pregnancy to support the operations of the intellect. And of course, the intellect being the, the thing which makes us a person. At that point, the human soul is in, infused all at once by God. Before that time, human soul is an animal, and before that, a vegetable. The only problem is there is not a shred of biological evidence to support that. Traducianism was held by Gregory of Nyssa and Maximus the Confessor. And this is what they say, based on the example of Christ, who had been pronounced by the ecumenical church councils to be fully human and fully divine from the first moment of his conception. That implied that he possessed at that moment a spiritual soul. So if, as the Bible teaches, and, and I will, here's a, here's a self-confession, I, I hold this view. If, as the Bible teaches, Christ was like us, human, in all things, except for sin, then it must be true that all human beings receive a spiritual soul at conception, and I would modify that to say fertilization as well. So if human beings are made in the image of God, who is the I am, and if the incarnation of Christ took into divinity our humanity from the moment of fertilization, then the embryonic, fetal, neonatal, child, and adult stages of human beings through death and into the resurrection are all together human existence, human beingness, then all human beings are in the sphere of love and protection. So my neighbor is the human being that God has put into my life to care for as he cares for me. Well, what does this mean? You know, when we look back at this story, and there's, there's a lot of very profound things in in the story of uh, the, the Good Samaritan. One of the really profound things is that it was, the, it was a Pharisee, it was a teacher of the law, it was a person within the believing community who went to Jesus and said, who's my neighbor, okay, of all people. So we can know all these things, we can have all this cognitive knowledge of Christianity and, and that, but somewhere in our heart there needs to be a compassion and recognition that not only does God have a relationship with me, but God also has a relationship with you, Scott. And because God has a relationship with you and he made you, my obligation, whether I like you or not, whether you're convenient in my life at this point or not, is to love you. Why? Because God loves me. And and he loves me for a particular purpose, and that is to love you, to love my neighbor. So we look at another, another part of this, the, the, the um, man who is on the road, and he's come upon by robbers. Those robbers t- 
took away everything he had. Okay. The woman who is in, who makes the decision for abortion, knowingly or unknowingly, puts herself in a position of being beaten up by robbers, stripped, and left to die. So it, she is in an extremely vulnerable position. And it's easy, it's so easy to pass by and say, that's a horrible thing to do, but fortunately it's not my problem and I will never do that. Okay? but you may be beaten and stripped by robbers and left to die at some point. It's also very easy to say, we'll not have anything to do with that person, and I'm gonna take this up more in the chapel talk tomorrow. Jesus didn't do either of those two things. What did he do? He went, he bandaged her wounds, he put her on his own donkey, donkey of the church, and he carried her to a place where she could be taken care of. So I think, of, of all things, this particular story shows us that what we have, what we need, is to look beyond, we, we need to somehow get to the point beyond the polarizing rhetoric and say, what is it that, that we are for? What are, what are we trying to do with our life and, and with our love for Christ we're trying to communicate that every human being, every human being has value, they all have a place, and they have a place in our love, they have a place in our heart, they have a place in our protection. And when you see a person who is in a vulnerable situation, and when you are, uh, when you as a woman are, uh, are in a situation where you're pregnant, and there's nobody else around to help you, it is extremely tempting to say, I'm out of here, Can't, I'm gonna cancel it. I'm out of here, I cannot do this. And you know what, that person's 100% right. They cannot do this on their own strength. They can't be a mom on their own strength, they can't go through labor on their own strength, or pregnancy on their own strength, they were never meant to. For the woman who's, who uh, is pregnant, uh, at a time when it's not convenient for her, this is an outstanding opportunity for her to run and throw herself at the feet of the cross and to say, Lord, I cannot do this. I can't see the way forward. I can't see what to do. You are going to have to pour your love around me so that I can do what I know is the right thing, which is to accept this neighbor that you've given me and care for this neighbor, even though I don't have the strength to do it, but I know you, Lord, do have the strength to do it. I was delighted to be able to come here and talk to you, because on my heart, deeply on my heart, is that the statistics for abortion inside the church, for, for people, for women who attend church once a week, are no different than the statistics for women who don't attend church at all. Do you know that? They have abortions at the same rate. Why is that? What are we missing in our message from the Lord? What are we missing about love and compassion? And one of the things we'll talk about again tomorrow is part of the provision for a mom is the father. Okay, so that's one of the things we'll be thinking about and kind of exploring more tomorrow. But I would invite you to rethink the whole abortion issue. Take, take away the rhetoric, Republican, Democrat, conservative, liberal, whatever, take it away. And put it in the context of the Good Samaritan. Put it in the context of the neighbor who the Lord has given you to care for, to love. There's, it's very tempting as a Christian, and especially as an evangelical Christian, to say, well, I'm gonna go out and do great things for the Lord, I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do that, and I'm gonna neglect the things that he has clearly chosen for me, that I haven't chosen for myself, my unchosen obligations, like my mom who's got dementia, like serving 
this child who the Lord has now put undeniably in my life. There are things that the Lord puts undeniably in our life. They are unchosen obligations. And we're in a day and age where we don't deal with unchosen obligations. Hey, it's my life. I can do what I want. I can be what I want, whenever I want, however I want, if I want. But what if you don't want? But God wants you to do it. See, this is, this is the transition as, as you mature as a Christian. You understand, like Jesus said to Peter, he said, when, you, when you're young, you know, you go about and do as you, as you want. But when you're old, others will come out and they'll stretch out your hands and they'll take you where you don't want to go, explaining how Peter was to die, okay? So when we, when we mature as Christians, we realize the call to follow Jesus is a call to crucifixion. That's what makes it incomprehensible to those outside the church. And that's one of the challenges in the whole area of abortion because what we're calling people to do is we're calling people to take up their cross in love for their neighbor. Wow, do you think that's gonna resonate with our culture? It doesn't, it doesn't resonate, okay? But within our understanding of what Christ did for us, that's what he's asking us to do. That's where the rubber meets the road, guys. When you, you, it's very easy to talk about being a Christian, but when you have to pick up and carry one of those unchosen obligations, that's when you really feel what it means to be a Christian, and that's when you also feel Christ behind you, shouldering that load and walking with you. So this is the, this is the message I wanted you to contemplate, just kind of a rethink of the whole abortion issue, rethink of it in terms of what are the unchosen obligations that the Lord clearly, clearly puts on our heart to do, and how do we respond to those in love for our neighbor? Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles, with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.